but for scrappy like you don't you're not still in the restaurant business if you don't have this inside you this is a piece right. of you like you figure out how to make it happen um whether that's getting the food on the plate or fixing the plumbing during service or putting a fire out on the roof while you're pouring a glass of wine in the other hand it's like that's what we do in this business right yeah so thank you so much uh, uh jumping on board into this interview um in on such sh short notice uh, mark um so mark you guys own and run uh, canless out in seattle one of the best restaurants in the whole united states and in the world you guys won multiple james beard uh foundation awards and um yeah, so I'm super, super excited to bring you on board. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about what Canlis is for the people that don't know what they are? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, that was subjective whether or not we're, we're, <laughs> we'd like to be one of the best restaurants in the world. I think that's what we're kind of set out to do. It's what my grandfather set out to do in the very beginning. So he opened this in 1950 and my parents ran it for 30 years. Um, and my brother and I took over like 15 years ago. Right. and have been doing it ever since. And so, um, yeah, we're a fine dining restaurant in Seattle. We're perched up on this hill, a really stunning view. I'm sorry that I didn't give that to you, but did you, you should see like what's happening. I don't know if you can see out there, but. Wow, yes. That's what I'm looking at. Sorry that you have to look at me. Um, but it is, um, you know, it's a, it's a restaurant that is about hospitality. It's about learning um, what that word means both internally and externally. It's about learning um, how to run a business um, around the concept of hospitality, and, and we take that word pretty seriously. Um, so it, it looks like a fancy restaurant. Um, it, it's a couple hundred dollars per person, it's reservation only, and, um, and yeah, there's been a lot of awards and a lot of accolades, but at, the, at, at its core, um, 115 people trying to figure out what it looks like to engage in honestly um, service uh, serving other people and, and doing it through food and through those types of things you know the wine and, and, the, and the things that we're all familiar with about the restaurant industry right and actually you know what something that i i learned a little bit about you is that part of your family actually you know what a lot of your family members are from the military and i just want to bring, bring that up because it's super interesting yeah. It's crazy. We kind of we say it's like the, this. This restaurant is a tale of two grandfathers, kind of. So the my dad's dad, um, the one Peter Canlis, who started the restaurant, was really like in so many ways ahead of his time to build this kind of a place to do it with the with sort of the standards and the foresight and the and the vision that he had. Um, he's like a, a, a like a restaurant tour through and through, and. Um, the concept of team styled service, the concept of tip pools, the concept of kitchens open in the dining room and cooking food a la minute or a la carte back when you didn't have a steak was, you didn't take a temp, you just like, they brought out a big roast and you carved it table side, right? Like that's, that's we're talking about the forties here. And so um, anyway, uh, my mom's dad was in the Marines for 39 years and all my uncles were pilots. My father was in the Navy. And, um, and Brian and I ended up in the Air Force as a way to pay for, for college and sort of being that, uh, I don't know, foundation that like early, like young 20s foothold on leadership and that kind of thing. We just thought it'd be a good place to start. So yeah, we have a lot of, we got a lot of military in the family. We got a lot of restaurants in the family and that's not sure we have one restaurant, but a lot of people who have been in that industry and it goes all the way back to my great grandparents. 1910 at a restaurant in Stockton, California. So if you include them, we've been doing this for a long time as a family. And yet, I think so much of who we are today and kind of where we take our cues from comes from some of that training outside of the restaurant. So. Right, right, right. That's that's actually what part of the reason would you say that you're able to actually service so many people? Actually, you were, I remember you talking about like you're serving saying more than 1,200 people per day through your drive through It's like somewhat drawing back that's to the crazy. roots with how your grandparents um, actually served more than 3,000 people per day, or yeah. that's crazy in the military, it's right? Crazy. Like crazy, yeah. He was in Hawaii and uh, during Pearl Harbor. So, you know, in those days, everybody came to help out. Everybody was a part of the effort and one way or the other. And he ends up, you know, talking smack on base about the food and kind of the chef throws in the towel and says, hey, you think you can do a better job? You, know, you try it. Yeah. And he did, right? So he took over all the food service of the USO back in during the war. And then after the war, opened up that restaurant in Hawaii. But um, 
So yeah, maybe at our roots is, is, is less fine dining and, and less tweezer food and more just sort of uh, feeding the masses. Um, I don't know, dr opening that drive through felt to us a little bit like getting back to some of the soul. People talk about soul food, but like some of the soul service, um, the, the idea that you're just making what you do available to as many people as you possibly can. And that was fun for us. I was talking to Chef about it this morning. Um, that it was cool to be able to exercise that muscle and so much of this place. Yeah, it can be hard to get a reservation or just even it's like kind of scary to walk into a, a formal restaurant sometimes and uh, try as we might to make it not feel that way. And so to be able to greet this sort of new season of life and of what the economy is doing with something as approachable as a burger, a $14 burger and some you know, ripping hot, salty french fries and a handmade ice cream sandwich. I don't know, there was something that with us really resonated. It just connected with us. We're so life-giving to see all these people coming through. I mean, we had, I don't know, we sold out in a few hours every day. So that was a thousand burgers, about 400 veggie milk. So yeah, somewhere in the range of 14 or 15, you know, 1500 uh, folks coming through and to see them in their cars and to see the life and the joy and the energy and the amount of like the little family dynamics or like the little, here comes this old couple who's made it out of their place to come get a burger, you know, get some fresh air. And um, that was really cool. That was really special and, and, um, and uplifting and encouraging to kind of be received by the city in that way, to be, to be supported in that way. Um, right. And I don't Actually. know. Uh, on that note, um, let's rewind a little bit for our listeners yeah. or like our audience that actually don't really know about like, you know, how you, what, what do you mean by drive through, right? Like, I don't think sure. they, they, they truly understand like the, the overhaul that so, you need. Normally when you pull into Canlis, um, you know, you're all fancy. And I think we're the last restaurant on the planet with a dress code. Um, but, uh, there's something cool about looking good and being respectful to others that way. And. You get out of your car under this poor cachet, which is like a fancy French word for a thing that you drive under. And our valet is like, take your car and whisk it away, right? And then we open the door and here's this sort of like, there's an arrival to Canlis and uh, Roland Terry was the architect built it into the building. So you come off of this busy street off of Aurora Avenue. And then, you know, there's this sort of like receiving of you outside. Anyway. So fine dining was not what Seattle needed uh, in the midst of the pandemic and as I so, went through shutting down. And so we that, opened a drive through That was, we just <laughs> shut the restaurant down. We canceled a thousand reservations and we said, we're gonna just serve burgers. We're just gonna do like food for the masses and food that'll just kind of encourage your soul and, and also do it in a way that was um, with the new rules of the economy, with social distancing and no contact and um, the, the whole goal here at Wilson was like, when we saw this thing coming, we sat down on the table and said, hey, look, um, the game's not up. It's just the rules have changed. And it's like they changed the rules on us in the middle of the game. So it was like calling a timeout saying, does anyone know? <laughs> like the referee is not, like the economy is different. Like the referee is not doing, he's not blowing the whistle when we thought, right? Like everything has shifted. Does anyone know the rules? We just kind of laid out everything we could. Okay, six feet and gloves and masks and no contact, right? And takeout is okay. So if these are the new rules and these are the resources that we have, 115 employees and a really capable kitchen, hey, we're on a busy road. Why not just open a drive-thru? So that's where that thing came from. It was this idea of, let's start with what we're thankful for. Uh, we're thankful that we're all healthy. We're thankful that we um, we have the opportunity to, to stay employed and do it in a safe way. Uh, we're thankful that we have a web designer guy who we can call up and create a website for this thing. And it was just from that place of, yeah, this is uncertain. These times, sure, you read it every first line of every article, the uncertainty of these times. But I think to lean back on the certainty of them, which is, this is who we are as people. This is where we are today. Um, today, it's sunny outside in Seattle, so I got that. Today, this morning, the sky didn't fall, so I got that. I got an amazing staff who wants to work, and that's what we did. We changed from a fine dining restaurant to a drive through and a home delivery service. And, you know, we have a shipping container in our parking lot with pizza oven in it, so it's like, <laughs> 
all right, we got one of those, so why don't we make bagels? One of my expediters, an amazing baker from the Lower East Side in Manhattan, she makes an amazing bagels. So I was like, hey, here's an opportunity to keep another 10 of our, of our staff employed. So we rolled each of those ideas out Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just throughout the week. And in doing so, we're able to keep all of our employees working. So one thing that I really want people to understand is actually before we, we, we get there, how much is an average ticket price for your fine dining experience? Like in general, yeah, in circumstances? Dinner, so we do like a four course meal, four, it ends up being like six, um, but it's $135 for food. Okay, so and you went from $130 dollars worth of average yeah. ticket price down to fifteen dollars burgers. Fourteen. Fourteen. They should have been fifteen. Yeah, they should have probably been eighteen. You know the crazy thing here is when you're opening restaurants, so candles we've been working on like refining it for 60, 70 years now, right? Like making it as efficient as we can. And here it was like, does anyone know what we're doing? No. Okay, no one knows what we're doing. Cool. How much should a burger be? I don't know. Fourteen dollars still good. As it turns out $14 was too cheap. We did not make money in the first week. We lost money. My brother, who I run the company with, had just had a baby, and so he was out that week. You know, and I'm like, I'm not the numbers guy at all. Like, I'm like, hey, it's a good idea. This will be fun. And he's the guy who's like, dude, that's not going to make any money. Like, you realize we're just going to bleed cash during this thing. So we did not make any money in the first week. But to be honest, I don't, or the second week, I don't think, I don't think this is a time about making money. Mm -hmm. And Canlas profit um, has is never been a strategy. It is a rule to the game. It's something that where we say, look, the the rules are, oh, you got to make enough so that we can all pay the bills and keep the lights on. Um, but that rule can change. You could make enough so you can put some in the bank for later, or you could make not enough and have to use some savings right now. That's a that's a moving target, just like anything. You kick the ball out of bounds. Um, well, the other team gets a throw in, but just because you kick the ball out of bounds doesn't mean that the soccer game is over, right? And just because you lose money for a week or for a year doesn't mean that it's over. It just means you need to start paying attention to that rule a bit more. So um, I think this is a season right now where companies, big and small, need to focus on doing the right thing and putting profit second. And maybe that's a good wake-up call for all of us. That's not a pandemic thing necessarily. That's a great strategy business regardless of what's going on so um anyway we should have raised the prices but yeah we went from 135 dollars a person to 14. not something was, that i the reason why i brought that up is that i want our, our our audience and our viewers to actually understand that you your your business has been in the making for you know decades for to to, to adhere to that level of 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 quality and all of a sudden you were able to shift and adapt to the change of rules just on the dime with over 115 people you know that's super super impressive like because of the fact that you know like all these operations all these systems that you created all these uh, manuals handbooks and you know SOPs of creating things and all of a sudden you just switch the dime and you just changed everything it's like you know trying to change this huge cruise ship and and turning 90 degrees on a dime that's very very impressive and something that is super inspirational for our listeners is because of the fact mm -hmm. that you know a lot of our small business owners they they're so soaked up in the noise of what's happening in the world every time trump speaks they're like oh my god like the you know, world's falling down or da 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 so yeah. and so forth and they're not really paying attention to their own game they're not really paying yeah. attention to what they can do in their control so true no, right so true and yeah. for you it's something that's super inspiring because like i'm like wow you guys are changing on the dime and leading oh no, wilson I, I think that's you're you're making such an important point and right now look the temptation of course like i crawl into bed i get on my phone i'm like oh, i read all through and and there's a piece of me that says, okay, Mark, you have to do this. Like, this is a time where we need to be aware. We need to be educated. We can't put our heads in the sand right now. And then you see people doing that. They're paying the consequences, sure. But at the same time, you know, I think you could stay educated and aware in about 20 to 30 hard hitting minutes. And after that, I think you, I think we're, we're feeding anxiety. And so, um, yeah, I just, we made a discipline around here to not start the day that way. Um, to start the day being thankful for what we have and for counting the resources that we do have, not 
being scared of the things that we don't. Um, yes, there's a lot of uncertainty. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to buy toilet paper or buy food or if there'll be a doctor if I go to the hospital. All different level ranges of uncertainty. And that's important to be aware of. I don't want to minimize that in any way. But at the same time, just as important, maybe even more so, is to be aware of the, of the certainty, right? And so the certainty says, well, I'm sheltering in place in my house, which is a really safe place. Um, I'm healthy today, which is something to be thankful for. In fact, counting our blessings is really a healthy process. Saying it out loud to your children and to your wife and to your staff, you guys, this is what we have today. And while this is hard all around us, there's also good happening. How can we focus on that? And from a strategical standpoint for your business, you can do the exact same thing. You can say, this is what we have as a company. This is what we can do. And no, we don't know the future. We don't have, we don't have a crystal ball. No one's looking way out there and saying, and everybody wants to know, like, what's the future of restaurants? It's kind of a silly question right now. It's a, it's a little bit of a tone deaf question. And, and I think a more important one is what can we do today? How can I encourage the people immediately around me, the person on my left, the woman on my right, like, hey guys, where, what are we gonna do today? Let's not worry about tomorrow. That's never been a good strategy, <laughs> right? So, it's, not yeah. that we, uh, it's not that we ignore it, but right now, I don't think that should be the primary focus of our attention. Right, and, so, and then uh, one analogy that you used, which really, really resonated with me was like, hey, you know what? It's not time to play defense, you know? Like we, we don't wanna hunker down and bunker down and just, you know what, yeah. just cry under our bed and just be like, oh my God, stimulus package. Well, we do wanna here. do that, but it's probably not a good strategy, right? Like, like I feel that way, right? Like I right. definitely feel, and, and when this thing first hit, look, Seattle was a little bit taken aback. Like we had the wind knocked out of us, right? And. And the feeling was hunker down. The feeling was protect. And any of us, I mean, when you're vulnerable, that's the thing. You kind of do this, pull the covers, or you or you, you you guard. And um, I think what we realized was, um, while some amount of protection is important or is responsible or is wise, um, that overreaction is probably um, taking it too far. And so, how do we keep? How do we hold both at the same time? How do we live in the tension of wanting to just completely retreat, hide under the covers and 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 hum something to ourselves and wait for the for the bad monster to go away, right? Um, that's within all of us. And um, and at the same time, at some point, you gotta you gotta peek around the corner, you gotta look into the darkness, you gotta peer into that void of unknown, and you have to courageously move forward that is human it is as human to courageously do that as it is to cower in fear we uh, that's what's so dynamic about us as, as a species and um and so i think to ask yourself the question what does it look like to endure what does it look like um to normalize this what does it look like to embrace the loss that we're experiencing right now in the midst of recognizing that our loss is not as great as someone else's loss right now. That's, those are hard things to do. Those are courageous things to do. And I think that's what we're being called into. That's the medal of uh, any, any people is to say, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's, it's doing what you're convicted to do in the midst of fear. And I, um, yeah, if, if there's one lesson out of this, maybe that I'm learning in this whole thing is, um, I think this is an opportunity introspectively to say, well, what kind of person do I want to be? And here's an opportunity to do that, right? And everyone wants to, to say, well, at the end of this thing, you know, it's all going to be different. But that isn't necessarily true unless the difference comes from each of us internally. If I'm waiting for you to change because of this thing, and you're waiting for me to change because of this thing, or I point at President Trump, which I is tempting or he points at someone else which is very tempting for him right if if all the fingers start pointing and say well on the other side of this thing as long as you come out different we'll be good to go that's bullshit that's just not true like this is an opportunity for each of us right now to say look i'm gonna honor the suffering and the brokenness and the pain of this experience the the forced stillness tim keller says i'm gonna honor the the fact that we've been thrust into this thing against our will by letting it change me, well then there's a great place to start. 
right? And so that is a company, Brian and I, my brother and I, that's been our strategy as a team. And I think that's been our strategy as a company is to say, let it change us, let it affect us. And then when it all washes over us, what is left standing? What do we still have? And and let's move with that. Let's go with that. And, and anyway, I, I don't even know what your question was. That point. <laughs> no, like awesome. actually, you know what? W- one point that I do want to make like is, um, a lot of people think that, hey, you know what, um, you know, Canlis is doing super well, you know, even in the midst of everything they're doing, like, you know, 12,000 people drive, through, actually 14,000 people driving through every single day. You guys are selling out. You guys are doing super well. And people think that you guys are, are invincible, that you guys are like, hey, you know, what? you guys don't have fears that you guys are like, oh, so far untouchable and stuff like that. You guys don't have these negative thoughts. No. But the fact that yeah. you are actually able to tell us firsthand that, yo, like I suffer through the same thing, yet it's knowing the fact that I have the fears, but having the courage to take that step, to make that step. And that's precisely the essence of this whole interview is to encourage people. Isn't that that the thing? Like, we don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Everyone's like, well, how'd you make the the, the pivot? You know, I'm like, um, pivot, my God. Like, um, this isn't a pivot so much as this is looking inside and saying, is there something that we can do? And, and that's a, that's a very, is a like a radically different question. This was terrifying for us. This was, this was uh, our team sitting around the table, um, afraid and uncertain and um, wondering, um, uh, yeah, this this was not like, uh, Hey, we've got a, we've got an action. Uh, we know what to do. Please and tell us how much is your payroll per month? You know, let's let's tell our, our audience. Please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I think we spend somewhere in the range of four hundred fifty thousand dollars a month in labor. So we're talking so, about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, guys. Right? Something like that uh, per month. That's just labor. Yeah, four hundred to five hundred, kind of depending on what's going on, and um, let alone our mortgage. Um, let alone all the other fixed costs. So we're a standalone property um, with a large bank loan on how to pay for that property. And um, and we have, um, yeah, like any restaurant, um, this is a a day-to-day, month-to-month type of operation. So, um, but, you know, um, again, those are rules to the game. The rule says I need to, pay the mortgage. The rule says I could lay the people off and the state could pay them unemployment. But we also know if they keep working, um, then they get, uh, then it's a much better sort of path for them, right? And not to mention the burden that you're not placing on another system. So I think um, in this case, if you have the opportunity to keep any, some trickle of the economy flowing, A, that's a privilege. B, that's a responsibility. If you can do it safely, if you can do it within the new rules of, of operating, it's just uh, be really sensitive to what that is right now. So, right. but no, know what we were doing and this was scary. <laughs> okay, sure. so- we made so many mistakes. I can't even tell you, like, like the pricing structure is just the beginning of a, of a list of things that were completely broken about. Look, when we opened the first day, there was an hour to an hour and a half traffic jam around the restaurant. So the whole, the whole idea here is let's let's serve our neighbors, right? And then suddenly we're like shut down traffic. And so there was that, there was like, we didn't know how to, and so we had eight traffic people in the streets, which is one of the reasons, you know, you just can't afford to have fine dining people marshaling traffic at $14 <laughs> burgers. We're also grinding all of our dry aged meat into those burgers and hand making buns. and. So, but again, the point wasn't, oh man, let's not take a step forward because we don't know if that step is, is safe. I think it's as risky to do nothing as it is to do something, right? And so this is a really dynamic team. We can look at the numbers, we can say, cool. Okay, look, let's make this, 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 and this change. Yesterday, I rewrote the website that we created four weeks ago for the fourth time because there was like, well, that doesn't work anymore. Yesterday, we we reprogrammed the the same website we built a month ago for the third time. Like, we keep refining these things. And honestly, it's what the people want to do. It's what they were born to do. These guys, these are race cars. Let them drive, like, let them go. Like, give a challenge to them and say, you don't have to just hunker home at home. 
you want to do something, there is something you can do. And we're not medical professionals. We, we, I'm not going to come up with a vaccine. Um, but if I can encourage somebody, that's a really powerful thing. If I can feed them a meal, if I can remind them that tonight, it's okay to pour a glass of wine and to look everyone in the eye around the table and to say, you guys, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the fact that you're crazy enough to be quarantined with me. I'm thankful that we have our health. I'm thankful that we have this table and this meal before us. Like, there's a reason to raise a glass. And it isn't disrespectful of the brokenness. I think that is actually respectful. That's an embracing of where we are as society. Um, I think it's an important thing to do right now. So, that's what can you tell us okay that freaking amazing okay let's 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 give some more like meat and actionable items for our our, our our the people who are actually in the same shoes but let's say what can they do you know i think like first thing that you mentioned like let's action plan wise like how do you how do you motivate your team i think like some of your military experience definitely comes into play when when you know morale was like super low and i think that's mm -hmm. what's happening with a lot of different companies like mm -hmm. everyone's kind of scared how did you whip everyone back and like hey let's get going oh. no, no 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 it's exactly the opposite okay we didn't um when we hire someone here the only real question that matters is how we're working at canlas to help you become who you're hoping to become think about that for a second I'm assuming you can use a knife. I'm assuming you can carry a tray or, or if not, I'm assuming we can train you. So your fingers, you're going to cut them off. That's on you. I want to know how will working here help you become the kind of man or woman that you've always wanted to become? It's a very different question than what can you do for me and what can I do for you? Okay, so think of yourself as having a room full of people who are all hoping to become something, make something of themselves. That is the truth of every company on the planet. We all have that within us, right? We all have those values that matter to us. All Canlis did was unleash them, unlock them, and let them come out. All we said was, hey, there may be a road through this, and it might look like a drive through and a bagel shed pop up. It might look like home delivery. It might look like you guys driving boxes all over town or building CSA boxes in a tiki hut in our parking lot, which is what's currently happening right now. I don't know what it's going to look like. But there's one avenue through, and if you want in, you can have it. And they, they bring the motivation. If, if Canlis needed Brian and I to motivate the staff, we'd be, we'd be screwed. We'd be dead in the water years ago, right? All we're doing as leaders is allowing them to become the kind of people they want to become. And in this situation, you're allowing them a chance to endure. You're allowing them a chance to take all that they've been given and put it into action. The feeling in this restaurant after we made this announcement was like, we have something to do and we're capable of doing it. It felt as if 70 years of fine dining was training grounds for this moment. Mm -hmm. And when everyone says, how did you change like this? How did you pivot Canlis away from what you do? I would say, we're doing Canlis better today than we've ever done it. Remember, fine dining is the service of other people with food. How do I care for you with food? Who cares what that bite looks like? Night, it looks like cheesy lasagna that you and your kids would just dive into. And maybe at another time, it'll look like really thought through, um, curated and otherwise um, um, precious, delicate art on the table. I, I don't know. Right. Um, the, the point isn't and never was about the food. It never was about a bottle of wine. It was always about the guest. It was always about, is there a way to serve somebody? In the old days, we had a fine dining restaurant. And today, uh, I, or enchiladas, I don't know what we're making tonight, actually. Um, <laughs> it, it's, about, it's about that. And so I, I feel in so many ways we're doing exactly what we've always done. And all we did was allow the staff to keep doing what was in their hearts. Right. The same, with the same values. These are the same people. What they're producing looks different. But so, you know, that's a huge. that much different if you think about it. That's a huge testament to the culture that you've built. And, you know, when, when tides out, you can see like who, who doesn't have pants on that kind of theory where yeah. you've actually done so well in building the right culture. For your business which allows you to be able to turn on the dime and allows you yeah. to actually build the infrastructure where you are just providing an empowerment 
and empowering your staff and the, these people to live their dreams to unleash their power so that's a real testament of the importance of the culture that you're able to build so mm. thank you for that um can you illustrate actually when you were telling just tell us that story when when you told your staff that that, yeah. moment, that story of how how it went like well, it was, it was a little terrifying. We hadn't told the media yet, and uh, we have a practice here of letting our staff know pretty much long before. Uh, and then just kind of holding those things close holds. We gotta, we gotta work through it as a team, um, and we need to sort of use them as a sounding board sometimes. And, um, and so uh, we met as, a, as an executive team uh, a few days before, and we said, isn't it true that this might be a good path for us to take? And then. Um, just got the whole team together and said, guys, this is what we're thinking about. And, um, and it was, um, yeah, I would say before that meeting in the restaurant, there was a little bit of a feeling of either helplessness or hopelessness or some sort of like, oh man. And then afterwards there was this feeling of, we've got a job to do, like put me in coach. And I remember 9-11, I was in the military at the time and um, we were part of a group of uh, people that did uh, helicopters and stuff and so anyway um, in that period the, the reaction at least in this country was like was so like whoa what do we do but in the military it was very different the reaction was we know exactly what to do we've been training for this and I think um, I think it, it reminded that meeting here in the restaurant reminded me of of 2001 uh, of being in the military was like, hey, wait, we, we know exactly what to do. And I think there was a sentiment of like, hey, put, put me in. Like, I, I want to be a part of the solution here. And I also just think it's, um, it can be a real blessing personally to be the bearer of good news. And when you get to bring good news to someone, when you get to say an encouraging word, when you get to uh, we all know this at Christmas time. Why is it better to give than to receive or whatever the expression is? Like, yup. <laughs> like it's life giving. It is good for the bones to be the bearer of good news, right? Like, and so, um, we got to be a part of that. And I, and, and so, um, how did your team yeah. receive that? Um, by and large really well. And, uh, you know, we have people who, um, are, more on sort of immunocompromised or maybe older or um, all look, all of us are looking at the risk and all of us are, are processing this differently. We need to, every one of us on the planet is thinking about this and it affects all of us differently. And so um, I think it's really important A, to make it voluntary and B, to really have options, like true options for those that are like, I don't know if that works for me, it doesn't work for me. So, um, We've been moving people around and taking and spreading out the kitchen and using parts of our dining room for staging. I have piano players driving delivery. We have people in the kitchen working outside in the parking lot because for the more air. And uh, we took one of the members of the office and gave him one of the private dining rooms, you know, because he's got asthma. And, um, it's like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And I feel like restaurants, if there's one thing that unites all of us, there's many things that unite us. But look, we're scrappy. Like, you don't, you're not still in the restaurant business if you don't have this inside you. This is a piece right. of you. Like, you figure out how to make it happen. Um, whether that's getting the food on the plate or fixing the plumbing during service or putting a fire out on the roof while you're pouring a glass of wine in the other hand. It's like, that's what we do in this business, right? I put out four fires during service in the company and like, it's what we do. And so um, in a certain sense to the industry that's been hit so hard, our industry, I would also, I would say, yes, that's true. And also what's true is that we are resilient. Also what's true is that in the business world, we're special ops. We're the guys that can make it through. We're the guys that can say, yep, anytime, any place. We got this, we can pull it off. We're the ones that work the weekends, work the crazy hours. We're the ones that go into battle when everyone else needs restoration. We're the ones giving it to them. And so um, we'll make it through, we will. And it's gonna be hard and it's gonna take courage, um, but we will make it through. I think there's a way to do that. So is, is there, um, can you enlighten us on your thought process on creating the strategies? Cause I know like you've, you've actually created so many different streams of, 
of, of, of arms, like from your uh, agricultural boxes, to your family meals, to your bottle service, drive through, yeah. bagel sheds. These are like five different initiatives that you're able yeah. to create just to fulfill your, your, your payroll. So for the people that, you know, how should they go about thinking about a strategy that 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 goes ahead with hey you know what i can leverage off what i have what would your lesson be um yeah i think the um let's see yeah those are all a little bit far afield from it so a, a couple just practical things um one i think delivery is totally doable um but i but we're not delivering canla um we were delivering family meal i think we, we called it family meal on the yeah. On the website, we called it family meal to everyone because that's what we were cooking. We were still cooking family meal for our staff. And it was like, how hard is it to put this in a container and deliver it? It's not hard. And so I'm not delivering canless level fine dining, um, contemporary Northwest cuisine. That doesn't package up in a box. It doesn't last. You can't put a souffle in a car and drive it down the street. It doesn't work. Right. Mm -hmm. But an enchilada you can in fact an enchilada almost wants to, to do that right like it's amazing the next day and um and so uh this is um these are meals that our staff knows how to crush because they've been doing it for the they've been doing it for one another these are their own mother's recipes these are things they've learned in other restaurants and so and it's not a menu it's not like we're giving you options look when we were kids mom's like all right time for dinner and you're like okay i wasn't like what's the menu I was just happy to have, you know, when you're a teenager, they used to eat everything. And if there's nothing in front of you, eat the table, right? So it's like, cool, meatballs, I'm in, right? And so we're just serving one thing a night. And I would encourage restaurants to just keep it simple. Like this is like, you don't have to get fancy with it. Take one dish that you just do and crush it. In every, almost every meal we've sent home is a camel salad. Why a camel salad? It travels well, it's super simple. We do it and it makes everybody happy. It's like crack to the vein. And you know what you need right now? A little bit of happiness. So like, give the people the camel salad, give them crack, like, why not, right? It's not creative. It's not necessarily, um, I don't feel like I'm like furthering my brand and showing Seattle how creative, like, nope. Give the people what they want. They want like a, they want simple, um heartwarming soul food right and so anyway we do one meal a night uh we sell them in advance which is not hard to do there's software out uh, we created software with talk actually back when this whole thing started uh, t-o-c-k the reservation company and um they've made it widely available and so any restaurant can download that thing sign up for it and and so we're selling a week in advance so that allows wow. us to order really precisely it allows us to make exactly what we need and not have any waste um, it allows you to um, route optimize delivery and, and have a couple of days to do so which allows you to schedule your staff so we're not using a delivery service um, even though a lot of them have made this um, more financially viable for the restaurant industry um, I need to employ as many people as I can. So servers who took food from the kitchen to the dining room can take food from the kitchen to your doorbell, right? It's not that hard and there's technology to do that. So we use an app called Routific, um, which just makes it super easy. So my servers don't even, they're quarantined in their home. They get in their cars, they show up in our parking lot. We pay them for the first 20 minutes to sanitize their entire car. Then they never get out of it. They pull through the same pork to share, a different team, an expediting and boxing team that has the entire dining room to work in, boxes the food, walks it outside, sets in the back seat of the service car. Wow. From that point forward, the address and everything is on their phone. Away they go. When they get outside, they text you and say, hey, I'm outside. I'm going to leave it on your doorstep. If they want, they can put a glove on, ring a doorbell, and walk away. That's it. So from a safety standpoint, it's super safe. It's really easy. Um, and there's there's technology to kind of make that thing happen. So anyway, I, yeah, I recommend using technology. It's really going to help. Those talk and routific have been um, lifesavers for us. Um, I recommend just doing one menu item or at least making your, your menu super simple. Um, I, I, you know, we shut down our normal website. Like just keep your messaging really clean and uh, keep it really direct and straightforward. 
Um, we use an 18% service and delivery fee. Um, I think that's really fair. And so we don't get all fancy with how much delivery costs. We just say like, this is what it is. And if you're at one mile away, thank you for paying what is probably way too much for a service and delivery fee. Like, I just think there's a lot of goodwill going around right now and people understand um, what it takes to kind of stand up. So yeah, keep it simple and uh, yummy. That's that's really, really good advice. You know, just to recap what you what you've said. You know, these are really good golden nuggets that you're unpacking with us. What you're saying is, uh, hey, delivery is a must. We're gonna be. You created many items that are good for delivery. I think that's what a lot of people miss because, like, for example, you wouldn't want to serve fries. You know, by the time you get to your customer, fries don't travel. Oh, Nobody yeah. wants a cold French fry. Like, exactly well. right so that's yeah. why you create a special menu keep it simple and easy use technology mm. leverage the technology you know it doesn't matter how how out of date you are things are super easy super intuitive just use the technology and last but not least you know what like just keep the messaging simple and that itself just allows you to be able to you know take that one step forward one step uh, on, the, on top of the other so these are really good nuggets that you're sharing with us uh, with us thank you i'm gonna leave it in the section um the, the comment section below description of the the two apps that you recommended do you have any right. kind of final remarks for our audience like you know i think um i guess i do i think <laughs> i think right now uh, a lot it might it might feel weird or um guilt-inducing to think of silver linings. But I find a lot of hope in finding the good in today. Um, it, by, by celebrating the good of today, it, it encourages me, it uplifts me, it helps me face um, the hard. And it helps me hold both. Um, and I think um, there are some remarkable silver linings coming out of this. Yesterday I read Alaska Airlines got rid of the middle seat. If no other reason, man, if we can get rid of middle seats on airplanes, that is worth like popping a lot of champagne, folks. Like, and even if it's just for right now, like, okay, I get it. But there are other ones maybe less obvious than getting rid of the middle seat. I think what's happening right now is that we are remembering, we are being reminded how alike we all are. That's what's happening. Um, how similar we actually are. And in a former, in former days when our petty differences took center stage and we let them distract us. Now, um, in ways that none of us would have asked for or invited, we have been reminded that there are more important things to pay attention to. And I think tonight that means looking at the people who you live with or calling someone if you live alone and celebrating them and saying thank you. I think tonight that looks like looking in the mirror and saying, what's one thing I want to change tomorrow? Because I got all day to do it. Because <laughs> a lot of us aren't working and there's nowhere to go. And, um, and if we're all doing that, then, and if we're all encouraging one another, and if we're all speaking about the good that's happening inside of us, well then, maybe we'll have a little more um, energy to face the darkness and a little more light to fight that with. And I think that is what Canlis wants to be doing with takeout, with delivery, with whatever we're doing. Um, it isn't about that. It, it's about so much more. So I would, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that says it right. But that's no, that's something like I, that. I love that. You know what? Always always like leave with a really positive note and i love that about you it's just like you're so internalized and and so much grateful so much blessful and it's just i think that's the essence of being happy in life too you know giving thanks and that's something that i i start you know what there's something really cool i want to share with you um giving thanks you know um just a quick side note um is that i give thanks every day as well which i can't find but you know what? <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you it's somewhere in yeah. my drawer okay um yeah. but yeah so for the people and for the listeners that want to follow you, um, the canless and or you personally, uh, what's what's the handle? Ah, uh, social media. We're at canless. I think I don't know. I'm never on social <laughs> media. My brother's gonna kill me right now. I think we have a Twitter feed. I know we do. And most of the stuff we do is on Instagram. I don't even. Cool. Know it is. <laughs> I'll leave it in the description below. 
to make sure your brother doesn't kill you. But thank you cool, so much, Mark. You. Actually, I found my 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 gratitude. Oh, what is it? You keeping a journal of things to be yeah. Every single I day. I love it. No uh, way. Look yes. at that thing. Guys. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Oh, Look at that thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am a total peach. I I connect with you. I I resonate so much because everything yeah. you say is 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 so true. I I love it. Thank you. And so much of who we are, we were given. It, it was a gift to us. So just to be to put that in perspective, that's certainly been true of my life. So hey, thanks for having me on and for paying attention to what you. we're doing. And a hundred percent. Be well up there, Wilson. It's great to um, it's great to be a part of this. So, cheers. <laughs>